Alex, why don't you introduce yourself? It's Alex uh, Hidalgo, and tell us a little about yourself. Uh, I'm currently the director of site reliability engineering at Noble Nine. Uh, I authored the uh, the SLO book, uh, implementing service level objectives. Uh, and before Noble Nine, I was at Squarespace for a few years, where one of my primary focuses was on implementing service level objectives. And before that, I was at Google, where the concept was first introduced to me. Squarespace is nice to see the blog platforms are still quite relevant. It's grown so much over the past few years. Niall Murphy. Hello, Niall. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you? Talk sure, keeping it together. Well, tell us about yourself, Niall. Well, it was a dark and stormy night in 1974 when, no, actually, I'll stop there. Uh, Niall Richard Murphy is my name. I am doing ESRI consulting at the moment. I have done a tour of duty of the uh, cloud providers, really, having been three years in Microsoft, 11 years in Google, and two years in Amazon. So all I'm saying is uh, Huawei better watch out or whoever the other <laughs> like, cloud provider is going to be. Uh, I have had some engagement with SLOs since I think the first SRE book, which I was responsible for instigating. And I've also uh, had the opportunity to contribute to Alex's book in that context as well. Excellent. And hi, Christina. Christina Bennett. Hi. And I'm, I'm at Google. I have been there uh, 12 years now, about uh, eight of those or so as an SRE. Uh, and I, right now I'm on customer reliability engineering and I contributed to the SRS book. I did some behind the scenes contrib contribution to Alex's SLO book. And uh, in fact, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be delivering my second iteration of uh, an SLOs and maintenance windows training with O'Reilly. So yeah, I've um, been spending a lot of time bringing SLOs uh, and other SRE practices to cloud customers and trying to improve reliability all around. What's going on on the ground out there? You know, there's lots more companies that are scaling now. It used to be just Google who we could talk about scale in some respects. Then it became uh, a number of others. Uh, you know, now we're seeing more, more and more companies dealing with scale in, in ways uh, that we never thought. There's uh, a grocery delivery services that have really had to uh, scale tremendously during the pandemic. So what's happening on the ground out there as these more companies learn to scale? What is it that body of knowledge that we're starting to learn um, about? And what is the role then of SREs and, and, and the role of SLOs and, and other objectives like SLIs before we get into what those actual promises should be or what they are or what they can be? So I can start because I think uh, uh, one of the most interesting parts here is that you talk about scale, and the first thing that comes to mind is size, right? You, you mentioned scale. You mentioned Google, a very large company with, you know, clearly a massive footprint across the entire planet, and you know, dozens and dozens of data centers, and you know, uh, thousands and thousands, if not millions, of machines, and that's what people think about when they think about SRE, uh, when they think about SLOs, when they think about scalability. But one of the reasons why this concept, uh, like this approach is, is getting so much more traction is because people are starting to realize it's not just applicable to huge companies because scale now means something different as well as people have migrated towards microservice architectures and using Kubernetes and containers. Suddenly you have dependencies upon dependencies upon dependencies. And that gives you the same problems that you previously only had at truly very large scale uh, you know, companies. So I think one of the reasons why people talk about SRE more and why more people are trying to adopt this and why people uh, talk about SLOs more is because due to the nature of the uh, modern cloud microservice-based infrastructure, you're running into the same problems that only the largest uh, companies used to. And I really feel like SLOs are going a long way to try and help connect uh, what these companies want to do with these services that are becoming more and more digital forward uh, to what are their business needs for that? How, how good does this service have to be? How do we 
taking into account what the users are experiencing from our services uh, from their perspective and make sure that our service meets those needs as we need them. Uh, yeah, so that they're, the SLOs are, are helping to build that bridge between users and product and their uh, development and operations. Yeah, what I, been, yeah, go ahead now. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think that's a, a valuable observation. And I also think it's it speaks probably to your work in the customer reliability engineering end of things, Christina. Uh, I have a, a slightly different view in, in two ways. I think the first thing to say is that coming back to your point, Alex, about um, the, the fact that large scale kind of compels you to have a conceptual framework for handling things, which allows you not to get buried in the noise. And that's one of the huge advantages of SLOs in that it helps to, to answer the question, what is it, what is it safe to ignore? which actually turns out to be a huge question when you're running more or less any kind of system. And yes, a large system. And yes, a complicated system, but also any kind of system. And answering successfully the question, what can I ignore? And, and still have the customer experience be the same, or even in the development context, you know, if you're, if you're writing a class and methods and so on, what is my abstraction for this particular task? And what can I successfully ignore and tidy away behind the, the boundary? Uh, those are all huge questions in modern software and systems engineering. And so uh, I, I suppose another thing that I tend to do is talk to a bunch of, we'll say CIOs and VPNs and so on, who are generally asking the question, you know, I've heard about this SRE thing, or I've heard of this SLO thing. Um, why should I care? What should I do? Those kinds of questions. Uh, and generally to them, I say that uh, if you're a CIO, you're familiar with the concept of KPI, key performance indicator, generally some number that you want to have for a thing, like how long is my sales cycle? If my sales cycle is 18 months, that seems a bit long, like maybe 1.8 months would be better. And you're trying to find a number to connect to some behavior or structure in your organization and kind of control that. So it's a really, it's kind of a, a high level steering mechanism for what you want to do. But in the SLO case, as opposed to the business KPI, <coughs> KPI case, you're really trying to connect this to the performance of the service or behavior of the service uh, and the user experience on the other side. And that's how I think about them. I mean, I think that's a great, great analogy. That's actually when people come to me and they say, how can we help describe this whole process? SLIs, SLOs, error budgets, you know, what, what even are these things and how can we be, uh, get people beyond engineering on board? I basically lay it out almost how Donald just did, right? An SLI is just a KPI just for your engineering team. An SLI is just a user journey, which is how your product team can understand it. Uh, an SLI is just a transactional test uh, for, for your quality insurance teams. You know, That turns out that people actually all care about the same things. It's just, we all use different language, uh, but that's a great way to be able to kind of bridge these silos and uh, you know, to bridge some of those gaps and just have better communications. And I really like the point about what can I ignore because I, uh, not only for itself, but also because I often have to deal with the the converse, the what's most important to us, right? Uh, knowing upfront, what is the thing I care most, that I'm gonna care most about? That's the thing that I have to make people happy on, not all the other things. Uh, to know that upfront, to know that everybody's agreed on what that is and not have to figure it out over again every time you try and make a decision to have that well-established. And uh, also to know how it connects to what you're trying to do, the user, the user journey. Because a lot of the time when I'm working with people who are trying to get SLOs set up and they'll say, what should I put an SLO on? And you say, well, what are your user journeys? And sometimes that's a lot less well-defined than you might have expected. And even just doing the, what are my user journeys part can really help uh, crystallize to some extent what it is you're trying to achieve. One of the things I pick up here is when you talk about, for instance, that user journey, 
and about what can be ignored and what can't be ignored. And then Kristen, you also talked about these connectors, right? Uh, that uh, being able to connect the things really. And one of the ways that I, you know, I, I have to think about this as someone who is, is uh, uh, following this space is thinking, well, you know, we, we often hear when it comes to complex technologies, it comes to the fact that how boring is it? You know, how really, you know, how, what, what, what can, it, why should I have to pay attention? Um, it should be, just be boring. It should be very, very boring. Just as, as much as like when I go upstairs to, to uh, the kitchen, I, I shouldn't have to check every time I go up to make sure that the, that the refrigerator is on. You know, I mean, I know it's on, it, it should be on, but there are times when if there's a bad storm, for instance, I may go upstairs and say, something's wrong. The, the, light, the lights don't, the, the clock's not right. You know, the, uh, wait, the refrigerator isn't working, you know? And so you, you, those things that you normally would ignore, you don't, you can't really ignore anymore in some respects. And so that's where I get, you know, that's where I get, I can start to feel like there's some nuances here to what we're talking about. What are the things that you should be figuring out what uh, should be connected? You know, what are the, some of those anomalies that, and how do you surface those anomalies? And then how does that play out into, you know, and, and into how you think about those overall promises? So to use your analogy of, you know, like the fridge going out, right? Um, because there was a power outage. Um, what you have to ask yourself is, uh, is the food still being taken care of, right? Because you don't care or you shouldn't care too much about the fridge ha not having power because the power may come back in five minutes. And in that time period, your food may also be fine. And that's kind of tying to Niall's point from earlier, right? About only caring about what you need to and, and you know, like ignoring the rest. Um, if you have frequent uh, outages, perhaps you need to investigate that. But if the power goes out for five minutes or even 20 minutes or perhaps even half an hour or more, fridges are actually really good at, at, at keeping cold in, right? That's why if you, if you have a lengthy power outage, you're always told like, don't open the fridge, right? Keep it closed as much as possible. Things will probably be fine for hours even. And, you know, an SLO based approach, that's what it's doing. An SLI, right? A service level indicator, the thing that tells you, is everything okay? For a fridge would be, is the food still safe to eat? And perhaps is the food still tasty, right? Uh, you may be measuring data quality, uh, you know, like in addition to, uh, you know, like availability, which might be represented by is the food still safe to eat in the first place or, um, but, you know, you don't have to set a trigger. You don't set an alarm on just losing the power because that's not what really matters. What really matters is, is the food safe to eat and is it still tasty? So what if... Uh... So, so if you're checking the fridge all the time um, to see if it's on, you have a greater chance of the food spoiling. Um, and so if the food is, so what is the equivalent in, you know, in the data center, like for instance, when there's an outage and like, what are some of the thinking that goes into, you know, what, what you touch and what you don't touch and, you know, and, and how do SLOs and, and uh, play it, play into that, that kind of uh, uh, environment, that kind of situation. Well, I, I feel like perhaps we're starting to stretch the analogy, but I think that uh, this would go into knowing when to keep, making sure that you don't make your signals too noisy, that you're not sending too much information to the people who have to be responding to these signals, and also not being too aggressive in the way that you would address things. So for instance, a lot of uh, issues in production come from making changes to production. And if you are oh, gonna be overly aggressive with like, you know, oh, the power is out, like let's fail over to our other refrigerator, like put everything in the backup freezer or whatever, you know, just because the power was out for two minutes, um, that's, that's too much, right? You're gonna cause more damage and trouble with this over aggressive reaction uh, than if you had just let it be for a couple minutes. I can see what you mean by the analogies. We can we can we can <laughs> focus on data centers, for instance, if we want. Uh, Niall, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I I think it's important to emphasize that, as I was saying earlier, 
SLOs in some sense are an approach allowing you to decide what you can safely ignore. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of things you can unsafely ignore as the past 12 to 14 months has taught us. Uh, but broadly speaking, in the data center context, I think the, the real gift of SLOs, particularly with respect to folks in a production engineering context, and I'll say they have some kind of on-call responsibility or responsibility for the performance of their production service, the uh, choosing an SLO allows you not to receive a page for every single missed query which it turns out, as Christina is saying, just imposes this huge tax and overhead where the individual or the teams in question have to react to every single event. And that means they can't choose important ones over unimportant ones, which is uh, I, one of the major benefits of this approach. How this expresses itself usually in a production context is that you set some number which is attached to some service level indicator, the tastiness of the food, the, uh, the yumminess of the HTTP responses you receive and so on. Uh, and uh, having attached some number to that, you can consume this thing called an error budget, which is basically one minus the number you have picked for the availability of the overall service. And you are allowed to have non-tasty HTTP responses for a certain amount of time or for a certain number of responses, depending on how you decided to calculate it. Uh, and that budget being exhausted at some rate, uh, you can have alerts or you can have configuration that tells you, look, you consumed 10% of your problem budget in the past, you know, hour or two, this probably means you should react uh, and do something about this before it becomes an issue, which will actually damage the customer experience that you and the business have decided to give the customer. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. I mean, it turns out that humans are okay with failure. They expect it. Hey, uh, imagine you're on a retail website and you click a link and maybe it just doesn't load, right? Just you straight up get like, you know, like some kind of error page or, you know, a timeout and maybe it was your internet. Maybe it was the actual website. Who knows? It doesn't matter. You're cool with that. You click refresh and then everything's fine. Right? You can have those things happen as long as they don't happen way, way, way too often. And it's really embracing that failure that I think is really at the heart of this, right? Uh, nothing is ever 100%. Um, nothing ever works all the time, absolutely nothing. And, uh, you know, acknowledge that and then pick that number that Niall was just talking about, pick a target that's reasonable for both your users, for them to remain happy, as well as your engineers to ensure that they're not being stretched too thin because it's exponential uh, trying to get closer and closer to, to 100%, right? It's a, it's a function approaching a limit. Uh, you'll never actually get there anyway right? You'll never have anything that operates perfectly at all points in time from all people's perspectives. Uh, because again, let's go back to like the consumer internet, you know, example, the consumer may not care if it was their internet that dropped out for a second or not. From their perspective, your website didn't load. So even if you can uh, think you can promise perfect uptime and perfect reliability on your end, there's so many other dependencies you have that that's not going to happen anyway. So, right. Use this process to pick a number that's reasonable, that doesn't overload you, that doesn't cost you too much money and still ensures that your users, that your customers are happy. Yeah, and I, I think another key point out of what Alex just said there is uh, to rehearse the basics, you often pick this as a number of nines, right? Two nines, 99% available, three nines, 99.9 .9, and so on and so forth. Uh, back in days of yore, the factoid that used to go the, uh, to go the rounds was that consumer internet devices were maybe two nines available at best. So on, well, on average or some kind of mathematical function, consumers aren't really even able to detect the kind of sparsely distributed failures like intermittent stuff that you often see in uh, complicated distributed systems. Of course, if all kinds of stuff are down for hours, yes, they'll probably notice. And so, uh, this is another way that SLOs allows us to distinguish 
uh, or to select the right kind of activity for the right kind of outage. So in a 100% outage, you consume that error budget uh, at a very, very fast rate, the one I was talking about previously, mm. and so you need to react faster. Mm. Yeah, that's a, a really important distinction that often takes people, some people time to grasp when they're moving for more traditional measurements that that yes we can we can measure these like how much please partial out it is it's not we're down or we're up four hours of being completely unavailable is horrible but also hopefully unlikely right but four hours of you know five percent of queries were getting dropped or something like that uh to be able to measure that like how bad is that is it actually sustainable for four hours maybe maybe not depends on your service and what you need to do um uh, yeah, so just to be able to to quantify that and and to know where your limits are in along a couple axes for reliability. And that's, that's actually oh, sorry. Uh, and I just want to say that's a hugely important point, Christina, because when I'm talking to CIOs and, and VP Engine and, and so on and so forth, often the mental model that people have of systems is kind of a hard down, hard up. Boolean style approach, one or zero. But actually, again, one of the things about the conceptual framework of SLOs is that it brings nuance and decimal points into one's understanding of the upness or downness of a system, uh, which is, again, new to people, sometimes an organizational uh, revelation, and sometimes this is well understood in other bits of the business, and you just transfer that concept across. But I interrupted Alex. So. <laughs> I think we interrupted each other. Um, yeah, I mean, it now said almost exactly what I was going to, just using slightly different words, right? Like, I think the one of the most important parts of an SLO-based approach and having an error budget is that it helps you capture things that you may not otherwise. If, especially at the leadership level, if you only think of a uh, 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 an incident as downtime, as as unavailability, then you know the only way you can measure that is by counting how many times you've been unavailable, or perhaps you know measure some kind of mean time to recovery. Right? How long did it take for you uh, in between the incident beginning and the incident to be resolved? And it turns out these are all really mathematically fallible uh, ways of thinking about reliability over time. Because what if you are two percent unreliable constantly? That might not be enough to trigger a page and therefore you never have an incident and therefore it never makes it into your incident register and therefore it's never calculated against your reliability over time. And it turns out that being 2% unreliable constantly is a way worse user experience than being down for four hours once a month. It's actually much better to have that big chunk, right? Uh, that may not always look great in the press as well. There's of course other factors here, but the point is just from a math standpoint, uh, an SLO and an error budget helps you capture these individual tiny bits of error and how they add up over time. And those little bits of error may not individually be worth paging a team or responding to. But once you're measuring things in that way, you're able to say, okay, this is what the user experience has actually been like. Even though we didn't have a hard outage, even though we didn't quote unquote go down, even though we were never unavailable, you're still able to get a better picture of here's how users actually experience interacting with us, which can help you capture so many different failure cases. So when it comes down to promises you've seen um, not kept over the past 12 to 14 months, what are some of those that come to mind and how would an error budget help? And could you help us explain how you keep an error budget? Like, how do you manage it? How do you, you know, how you create one? And so, you know, providing that with the context about um, broken promises and uh, and what we're learning. The one of my uh, takes on the topic of broken promises and SLOs is that I feel like I really want to know more about what is being promised to whom here, right? For one thing, teams use SLOs in different ways. Some of them are. Uh, for a team's internal regulation. Some of them are for, uh, you know, within the company, different services rely on each other and they want to know how much they can rely on their neighbor services. And some of them are for what you're promising to your higher ups, right? We promise our service is going to be 
uh, this good. And so what you're promising and what the consequences of breaking that promise is, is going to depend on how you're using that SLO. But also we, they've mentioned error budget a few times already, right? And the, the error budget is more, it's not a promise so much as like how much the space, how much, how much, how much budget do you have for making mistakes or, or just having, you know, uh, normal like percentages of errors and things um, so that uh, I'm, it's not to, to try and say that that's a promise, right? It's like, I promise I will try and stay within this budget. Um, and then if I don't, there's gonna be consequences just as if it were a money budget. Right. Um, but it's not, it's not like an SLA uh, where you're saying, I right. absolutely will be at this level or not. It's a, it's a different sort of a concept. Um, you wanna, so, sorry, I'm trying to hand it off to somebody else. No, no, that's great. Um, um, and so promises have a different meaning in many ways. So it's not necessarily, you know, in, um, in, a, you know, in, in, in monetary terms where you have a hundred dollars in your bank account and you go and, you know, and you, and you spend it down and it can go negative, right? If you spend all that hundred dollars or more, right? Uh, in, in this respect, the, the promises are, uh, are not necessary. They're, the promises are what then, you know, the, I mean, I think we think of the basic ones like, you know, um, uptime, maybe like you're talking about how many nines, um, how do you keep then, then how do you then, what is the context then for error budgets kind of within that context of promise where it's, more about kind of like, yeah, we're going to try to, we're going to try to maintain this level of availability all the time. Uh, these applications have a, had a tradition of, a, of high latency. So we're going to try to keep the, you know, the latency down to, uh, you know, to blow this, the, below this limit, you know, in terms of round trip and such. So where does the air budget play into that then? Well, there's a, a bit of a, a theory and, and practice difference here uh, just to address a little bit one of your previous points, um, which was respect to like how 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 many what kind of promises have we seen being violated over the right. over the past while? I think uh, any examination of the outages of any of the cloud providers, cloud consumers, et cetera, et cetera, like the past fourteen months, as everyone more or less woke up in in March and started using online services that they hadn't used before uh, uh, and flooding all kinds of systems with resource demands that they hadn't seen before. Past 12 or 14 months has been a litany of outages, mistakes and unforced errors on the behalf of nearly everyone. Uh, I think coming back to the point of a, a customer promise. Uh, and that's due to the demand because people just were home and not were not, you know, uh, so that's definitely part of it. Uh, and I, I think when you encounter exceptional situations of, of any sort, you tend to, to see the systems go into boundary conditions, right. which often makes them kind of a bit more vulnerable right. uh, to errors in, in various ways. But I'm not just talking about resource usage, of course, when everyone starts working from home and six months into it and you, you have new joiners and those new joiners aren't maybe necessarily as effective at, for example, resolving production problems because they haven't had the same upbringing as the other people who joined the team back when we were still kind of face to face. You can see all kinds of subtle, uh, potential subtleties for difficulties arising in how we manage um, online services in general. So I, I, the past 12 to 40 months have been very difficult for a whole pile of reasons and running online services is no exception. But to come back to the, the key point really, which is this customer promises idea, um, uh, uh, which is a, a term of art inside certain uh, cloud providers. The idea, or at least the theory of how it's supposed to work is that, okay, if you find yourself violating this customer promise of three and a half nines availability of your thing, uh, okay, sometimes in certain contexts, an SLA, a service level agreement with some kind of contractual compensation by the service between the service provider and the service consumer comes into play and some company hands over some money or some service credit or something like that. That is one potential avenue. 
but you often, uh, to speak more in, internally about what happens if an error budget is exceeded, the theory now says, well, you have blown your error budget. You cannot now give the customers the service level that you agreed that was appropriate for them to receive. So now, instead of spending error budget to do stuff, you don't have any error budget anymore. So instead, the development team, the production engineering team, SREs, et cetera, work together on making things more stable. So you work internally on reliability related work, often in the context of resolving the issue that led to you blowing out your error budget in the first place, because that's the clear and present danger, right? So have you, ever, have you ever blown out an error budget? Oh wow. yeah, I've oh, blown it out for oh, like yeah. a year and a half. If you like, if you haven't blown your error budget, you've set your target way too low. Like you're supposed to sometimes blow your error budget. Like that's the point. Like, like if if you know, you know again, it's like, you know, as now said, like it's not an agreement. There's no contract. There's no money that exchanges hands. There's you know, if you miss your SLO, it's a signal. It's a piece of data you can use to go to your team or your stakeholders or other people in your organization, whoever it may be, and say, hey, we have this data that appears to be telling us something. What should we do with that? And sometimes it's exactly what now said, right? Sometimes this is cool. We pause our current feature development work and we focus on reliability instead. Uh, sometimes it's nothing. Sometimes you say, oh, well, that was definitely a black swan incident. So we can actually just ignore it. Sometimes uh, you realize, oh shit, our SLIs are wrong, right? Like we've blown through our budget, but we're actually measuring the wrong thing. Uh, you know, there are so many different things that it can do, but that's that's really, I think the main point here is, is this is better data to have better discussions to make better decisions with, right? Having a very strictly enforced error budget policy that says something like, uh, stop shipping features and only focus on reliability. I've seen that used on teams and it actually backfires. Um, you know, it's, 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 it, it, again, you, you need to be thinking of it as a better way to get reporting data on your reliability from your user's perspective over time, and then use that to get together with whoever needs to and say, what does this tell us? What does this mean? What should we change moving forward? And that can be, yeah. I was just going to say to build on that point of this is a signal that we use at our discretion for our and our users benefit that sometimes you make the choice to be out of SLO for instance if you're making a product choice right you're saying I we have a feature uh it's going to be a little bit uh noisy or troublesome when we first release it but we promised we would release it and we want, we want it. It's gonna be amazing, it's gonna be great. And, and we think that users are okay with the fact that it's gonna be a little rocky to get started, right? You can go ahead and say product decision, we are pushing the feature. It's gonna be a little bit of work for everybody and we know that uh, and it's gonna be a little painful for users but in a good way. And we choose that we are going to spend that extra budget just as with, you know, you might choose to spend extra money budget on things that are important and new. Uh, you, you use that signal uh, to your benefit, and you can actually choose to overspend if that's the correct business decision. Yeah, I mean, to tie us to money budgets, right? We're all hopefully kind of coming out of a pandemic, and many of us have barely traveled for a very long time. And it's probably good for all of our mental health to take a good long vacation this summer. Uh, but what if you can't afford it? Do you put this on a credit card, even if you know you can't pay off that credit card for the next year, uh, accruing interest, and therefore costing you? Yeah, maybe you do, because maybe right now that vacation is way more important than the fact that you're going to be accruing interest over the, you know, like over the course of a year. So, right, sometimes you purposely spend over your budget uh, because you know that you can make it up later. And you know that in the short term, that overspend gives you something you really need. So everyone has their own lists, their own ways of tracking things, their own ways of knowing their budgets and such, what are your ways? What are the ways that you, that each of you manage your own air budgets? Well, I mean, I work for a company that measures them, right? <laughs> um, you, you know, mean. like I'm not here to sell it, but you know, like I can't answer it any other way. Noble Nine is a product that helps you measure SLOs and helps you calculate error budgets from a variety of sources. So uh, like I use Noble Nine. 
Okay. And so um, how about y'all? What like outside of the, the, the platform that you use though, do you have your own techniques? Is this a, an art? Is this a, an emerging science? Is this, this is obviously probably both, but what is it you're, what is it you're learning? What is it that you're, you're uh, finding out? What are you discovering about your own processes as the world becomes less and less complex? Just kidding. Just as it becomes crazier and crazier. Christina? Uh, I'm not 100% sure how to answer that, but I will say that I have found it extremely interesting, educational, not just for me, but for like SRE and, and SLOs in general from our, our general knowledge base. Every time we try and extend this whole concept to a, a slightly different service, like at this point, certain types like basic request response, uh services uh or data processing pipelines uh things like that have are are in many ways but not fully well-worn ground but then you try and say what if i try and make slos for uh, networking quality what if i try and make slos for uh you know a new kind of of mobile interaction or um what do you call smart internet devices and things like you know what what are SLOs for those things look like? And every time you apply it to a new domain or to a new service or uh, a different like retail vertical or whatever, uh, everything takes a different shape and you learn more about like, what are the real fundamentals here? Which things are part of this domain uh, and felt like they were real and solid. And then we tried to apply it to a different domain. We found, ah, the concepts are still there. The fundamentals are still there. Why am I doing this? user journeys and uh, like sign like quality signal, but then the details start to shift and mush and change. Uh, and I think that's what's been really interesting and educational. And I cannot answer solidly like what all those differences are across all those things <laughs> if I knew it would not fit in this conversation. Um, but I think that that, uh, that has been super interesting uh, to see develop. I think the uh, to build a little bit on Christina, what Christina said, the science bit of this is the bit that is relatively well understood, and that is the capturing of the data, the representation of that data, the display of that data, mm. and the programmatic acting on that data. Mm -hmm. I won't say it's easy. It is not easy. I will not say uh, that it is is trivial and uh, no one needs to care about it, like none of those things. But it is one of those things where if you set out to do it with the right mindset, you will conclude successfully and lots of people are building products and so on and so forth. Uh, fine. I'm aware of external products as other people on this panel have suggested. I'm also aware of internal systems across a large number of companies that do this kind of thing. That's fine. The art, the art is the difficult bit, and that is, hello, business. What would you like your user experience to be? And how would you like to connect this with the actions that your organization will take to defend that user experience? And that is immediately more in the domain of uh, human beings, soft influence, cross org conversations, decisions about what really matters, like all of those kinds of conversations. Gosh, this is where it gets really interesting. Um, and I was, uh, I was, I was uh, listening to a uh, discussion about um, uh, some leading uh, researchers out of Stanford who uh, uh, Andrew, and I'm going to pronounce, I'm going to mispronounce his last name, Young, uh, and is his NG. Um, and, uh, and another, and a woman, Faith Fay, I can't remember her last name, but they were talking about one of the things I think you really touch on is like the need to be close to what's happening. Because if you can't do that, then you miss so much. Because then when they're saying, like, you know, you might have like a, uh, an x ray, a, you know, um, um, you maybe have like an algorithm that's, that helps really refine the accuracy of an x-ray 
Um, but that actually, but, but that capability cannot walk down the street from one, you know, from one hospital to another and just apply it in the same way, because there are many differences. It might be the hardware, for instance, you know, there, there's all kinds of factors there. What, what it, what they were talking about though, it, you know, overall is the need to get into, uh, the workplace in this respect is the hospital where, um, you know, nurses are taking notes and, uh, you know, and clinicians are taking blood and there's all this information and all these different processes that then have to be then um, communicated in some way back to, for instance, the, you know, the, 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 the physician or the surgeon. And it gets into kind of like this, the, you know, these almost like these, um, I think where you, you refer to now, like, like, the people don't understand, there is like not this ability to kind of, kind of very easily connect these different kinds of worlds. Where so, you know, like if I, so, if we, so they, they really encourage engineers to go into the hospitals and, uh, you know, to be there with the nurses and with the, you know, people who are doing all this work, because it gives them an insight into the, into the, to, into the research itself, into the, you know, developing of the technology itself. And so I guess I'm getting to the getting to the point here that, you know, what you're talking about, Niall, it, are those places where there's not where there's a the light isn't there, right? Because the business can't necessarily see it, and so, you know, and so that's where it gets into I think where many in what you're talking about many is the, these cultural aspects of uh, you know uh, of the of the whole workplace, and. Yeah, and, I, and, and, and part of me wants to say, well, what's the point of this conversation? Well, you know, the point of it is not just broken promises, but isn't it that greater thing, you know, to try to being able to, to, to put more illumination on these, on these problems so those promises are better understood by all involved? Well, I, I think if the, if the question really is, do SLOs help you to understand or define what is important about your particular use case. They provide an abstract framework to allow you to express what is important, but they don't provide you with an algorithm which will just deterministically, given a set of inputs, spit out the thing you need to care about, right. which is why I say that's really in the domain of art. Now, it's a huge uh, benefit that we have a conceptual framework that will allow you to do that. And also, I, I think. You, you might have gathered from what I've said previously that SLOs are kind of cross domain. They lie somewhere between or over the business and production engineering in some sense. And so at the moment, the, the, the teams that are often pushing for SLOs inside an organization are often production engineering teams. And they're trying to solicit input from the business and decision makers and get them to do this. But actually you could see a world where SLOs become a, a commonly understood way for leadership and so on to structure their thoughts about what to do about their particular problems. Um, but I think really the, the king of the relatable examples on this panel is probably Alex Hidalgo. Uh, although I'm not sure he has one to mind in this particular instance? I mean, uh, the best drivers I've ever seen of SLO adoption across teams and across organizations, generally product managers and project managers. Mm. We, we may think of this as an SRE practice uh, that may be where it originated. And therefore, we think of it in terms of operations or production engineering or whatever terminology you, know, like you want to use, you know, the DevOpsy culture, uh, that's all well and good. And that might be because it was kind of invented there. And because there are many, many benefits for those kind of operational teams, right? Like uh, not getting alerted on every error, for example, but only when things are actually bad enough. But in my experience, uh, in organizations that grow and develop and really kind of, uh, you know, uh, accept that, uh, you know, nothing's ever perfect. You don't have to be perfect anyway, and therefore only try to be just good enough. It actually gets very quickly accepted by 
product, by business, uh, you know, by leadership even, um, because, you know, those are easy terms that you can use. Now you have easy numbers, right? You can say over the course of this last quarter, here's how reliable we were overall. And that helps you make decisions uh, as as leadership, uh, where do I send resources, right? Both uh, in terms of where do we need to hire more? Uh, where do we need to look at the management structure? Where do we need to literally spend more money? Um, you know, they're, 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 when done correctly, um, the primary driving forces often aren't engineers anymore. Uh, engineers sometimes actually have uh, this kind of, I don't say ambivalence, but um, they can get caught up in the concept of SLOs as just being a thing you do, right? Like, okay, let's pick our metrics and now we have a target percentage and okay, like, you know, like now we're done, right? Because they aren't close enough to the business value that these actually, you know, like produce. So, um, you know, I think it kind of depends on the org, it depends on the team, uh, but it's not always the case that the people doing the production work actually care about these numbers the most. And I agree. I would say that, uh, I don't think anyone anywhere could have a successful SLO, either in terms of measuring the correct thing or in terms of being uh, implemented and, and enforced appropriately as an organization without that collaboration, right? It's without talking to, if you're the production engineers, you know, like, the, the physical limitations of your system, how fast can our CPUs go and how much, how many queries per second can we hand, can our servers handle and things. Um, but you also need to know, like, what is our feature product map? What are our users' needs? Uh, how, like, what is our, our retail point, right? Like, what, how good do we have to be for their business to be profitable, right? None of that is something a product engineer should be the front line of worrying about. <laughs> um, and like, what is the what are, what is developer life like? Uh, what kind of velocity do they need to maintain? Uh, all of these things are things that need to go into choosing the right goal level. And so you can't choose that goal unless you have input and cooperation from all those groups. And then when it comes time to actually having an SLO and an error budget and having it be a signal that's useful to you over time, if you're the production engineers and you're monitoring this. SLO and error budget, and you're seeing we've used a bunch of error budget this cycle, and I think that we should really do like do whatever it is that you do, whether it's focus on reliability or something else. Um, they have to be in on this plan, right? You can't just say that to the developers and expect them to like redo all their sprints and decide, oh, we're doing completely different work now because the production engineer said so, um, right? <laughs> there has to be agreement that this is how this is going to work. Um, that everyone uh, was in on this plan when you made it and that when you make these requests, there's an expectation that that kind of request might be made and what action will be taken when it's made and that you'll have support from managers and directors and on up that that's an appropriate action to take, right? So if you don't have the buy-in from all of those people, there's just no way that it's going to work. It's not something production engineers can do on their own. I mean, yeah, and just to, sorry. Do you, do you want to go? Alex? No, 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 go. Just to, to pick up on that, Christina, I think that this is in some sense one of the, maybe the weaknesses of the model or an unexplored area of the model where if the agreement isn't there, then the model basically doesn't really work. And also if the agreement is there, but you blow through, for example, 18 months worth of error budget in uh, a day and a half, which is something I may or may not have done, uh, then the model tells you, okay, you're going to not launch any features for the next 18 months, which is not true. Like that's not going to happen. So we have this situation where if the scope of the failure is relatively small within defined numbers, then we know how to behave. But if it's relatively large, we don't know how to behave. And that is a, a bit of a, a question mark around it. But I, I, I do think uh, human agreement is at the heart of this in a very key way and if you don't have that uh, I mean in some sense coming back to my earlier point that production engineers are often appealing to other areas of the business to agree with them in order to have some kind of balance and, and run things effectively if that agreement isn't there um, and you're you're still compelled to to carry on 
S loads aren't going to solve anything for you, I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, like I'm almost like a broken record about this, but you know, like SLOs are better data to help you make better decisions. And you make better decisions by having better conversations. And sometimes the conversations are just with your teammates. Sometimes it's with the sister team. Sometimes it's with your entire org. Sometimes it's with the entire business. Sometimes it's with your customers. And, you know, but that's, that's really at the base of this approach. You know, there are many cool things you can do like alerting on burn rate. And you can probably reduce the total number of alerts because you get fewer false positives and you can report over time and reliability better because it's more mathematically sound than using means. And, you know, we can get into all of this other stuff, right? That's all still true. But at the absolute root of all this is, you know, are you measuring what your users care about? That's a service level indicator, right? Like that's an SLI. And all SLOs and error budgets are, it's just some pre-done math. That's really all it is. It's a math done ahead of time for you. So you can say, ah, this is what our user experience has been like. Maybe we should do this. And if I could take a second to tie this back around to the, the promises theme, right? That is what I would say. This, we are going to work together in a way we have agreed upon. That is the promise that I would see is an SLO, right? An SLO is that your groups have agreed on what we are all working for together and what we're going to do if we think it's not working. And uh, then, yeah, the consequence of that broken promise is like maybe we've chosen the wrong goal. Maybe we're not having the right conversations. Um, and that's the consequence of the broken promise of Nesolo. And that's when you might be able to see something else, I think, to Alex's point, where you might say, oh, you know, we, we didn't meet these promises, but look what we found over here. Yeah, totally. It's, not a catch-all system and it's not intended to be it's right. a different approach it's a different way of thinking about reliability i often mention to people you know they think of it as a project uh, a thing you can check off a list oh we have slos now that's not it it's a different way of talking about and thinking about reliability over time it's closer to something like using agile to plan your sprints than it is a technological solution kind of a continual commitment really uh, a, a commitment to understanding what's going on, which is substantially more sophisticated than other ways of managing your systems. But just to come back to the um, uh, SLOs, our, our pre-done math, I suspect you're going to tell us that machine learning is just statistics next, Alex. And this is going to be a big surprise to everyone. If anyone follows me on Twitter, uh, machine learning is just Bayesian statistics running all over. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's the Bayesian statistics. Well, thank you so much for uh, your time and to discuss uh, these issues about promises and SLOs and air budgets and uh, really the multidimensionality of promises and what promises really mean. It's not just a promise, but it's a promise among, among your peers in your community. And, but those might be overlapping groups and might be your business or your customers or or even your fellow teammates. So I think there's a context here for, for what you've uh, brought forward. So thank you very much. It's been enjoy it's been enjoyable. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Cheers.